Hi, I'm Keith Ghostland. Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. It's Tuesday, April 4th. <clears throat> Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. As you know, we're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. So let's take it away with Keith. And I'm going to start slightly differently than usual. I want to acknowledge the passing of a true Vermont legend and icon from the queer community. As people may have read, Michael Hayes, who most people know as Marguerite <coughs> LeMay, passed over due to a massive heart attack. What people should appreciate about Marguerite, other than being bigger than life and considering that Michael was six foot four before the stilettos got put on. That's, this was the comment from Darren Perrin. Marguerite had a smile that could light up a room. She's the queen who made the queen city a lot more fabulous. What people should appreciate about Michael Hayes and Bob Bullard, in Halloween 1992, they founded the House of LeMay because they wanted to go out and have greater community involvement, and they wanted to raise funds to support our efforts. And they were later joined by Lucy Bell LeMay. They were all from Hot Damn Trailer Park <laughs> in Beaver Pond, Vermont. And in their time since 1992, it is estimated they have raised well over 300 thousand dollars that have gone to charitable works, predominantly direct care services for people living with HIV. So safe journey. So this is National Poetry Month. And I'm going to say right up front, I started the clue and Professor Charles got it before I even finished it. <laughs> Although an obscure poet during their lifetime, they are widely considered the most distinguished Greek poet of the 20th century. They chose to circulate their verse among friends due to the highly personal nature of many poems and the highly erotic nature that made no attempt to conceal their sexual orientation. Without hesitation, she got it. It was right on the tip of my tongue, but she. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I, first thing. Right up front, salamander alert. It is that time of year when the salamanders and frogs are migrating into the bogs. <coughs> what Fish and Wildlife has said, rather than doing traditional traffic stops, if you happen to be driving and see salamanders or frogs migrating, stop, take a picture, and send it to them. Better than a roadblock. <laughs> so looking at events coming up, we've got Rainbow Umbrella with the women's in the books discussion groups, and I love the notes, and I love the conversations you're having. At, at some point, I may sneak in and hide behind the corner. Monday, April 10th, Kellogg Harvard Library starting at 6 p.m., and this is a live event. This is a Poem City LGBTQ plus poets. And it's Eve Alexandra, Allison Pine, Jay Turk, and maybe our own renowned Linda Quinlan. Isn't it Jordan Turk? Yeah, Jordan. But I, it was listed as Jay. That's it why was he listed did it. as yeah. Jay Turk. Oh. So that's, and one of them might be the you know wicked woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So Friday, April fourteenth, is out in Bradford. And it's from 5 to 9 p.m. And it's billed as a casual hangout. <clears throat> and it's at Vittles House of Brew. And they're trying to get this established second Friday of each month social gathering. Mark on your calendars. And there is still time to register for Saturday, April 22nd. This is the Health Summit at Vermont Technical College. 8 to 4, sponsored by the Pride Center, out in the open, outright Vermont. And if you go on to their website, they're starting to do listings of the workshops they're going to be offering. So you can look to see, ooh, I would really like to see this, or how could I miss that? Mark your calendar for upcoming event. 
Wednesday, May 3rd, and this is, I believe this is a hybrid event, but it, you can attend it at the Kellogg Library, 7 p.m., Dare Not Speak, the campaign to silence LGBTQ plus communities. It's a panel yeah. or a film? No, it, it is <clears throat> a presentation about the effort from the alt-right to silence and make <coughs> us invisible. So I'm thinking it should be really interesting. And I just want to put a plug out there of you know going, going around and checking for events, looking at all of the various groups, support mechanisms that our organizations are offering, such as Proud and Sober, Survivors of Sexual Violence, People with Disabilities, the Momentum Group for People Over 50, the five Friday night groups for our youth. Check their websites. You may find something that you didn't know was there that could actually help support you. So with that, oh, we're going. You're, you're, you're not going to challenge me with bad news, aren't you? Well, Trump was indicted today, and well, we'll see how that goes. But um, it was nice to see his lovely face sitting on the bench in front of the judge. And see how many times you can try and stall No matter what face. happens. OK. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're going to start out with transgender activists and transphobic conservatives on Twitter finally agree on something. Both groups are displeased with the social media platform for censoring in images of a poster advertising the Trans Day of Vengeance, a now canceled weekend protest against trans genocide. The protest, organized by a little known group called the Trans Radical Activist Network, was set to occur outside the U.S. Supreme Court this weekend. The event would have marked the annual Transgender Day of Visibility while also demonstrating against transphobic policies like bans on trans students, athletes, and gender-affirming care, which threaten the safety and well-being of trans people. On Tuesday, Twitter announced that it began automatically removing images of the event's poster when right-wing figures like Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican Georgia, and Senator J.D. Vance, Republican Ohio, began retweeting, retweeting its, it as proof of a violent occasion organized by a trans terrorist group, as Greene put it. So, mm. <clears throat> And at um, Donald Trump's rally in Waco, Texas, one person wearing an ultra mega t-shirt, said he didn't know how many people per year drag shows killed, but that it was definitely more than guns. Oh, that's outrageous. <laughs> the Trumper claimed that the long-term effects of drag shows on kids are more dangerous to their lives than guns. It's the stilettos. <laughs> <laughs> and when the interviewers shared the statistic that 48,000 people die every year from gun violence, the Trump supporter responded that there's probably 100,000 that die from drag shows. Oh, my gosh. So there you go. What a country. I know. A Louisiana library has decided to keep several LGBTQ <clears throat> children's books on the shelves despite heated opposition from white wing <coughs> residents. The St. Tammany... Library Control Board voted this week against banning five books. Four of the books in question were children's books about gender identity, including I Am Jazz, a children's picture book by and about trans youth activist Jazz Jennings, and My Rainbow, a children's book about a mother's love for her trans autistic daughter that was written by the mother-daughter duo. The library received multiple complaints about the titles, claiming they violated a 2017 state law banning this distribution of material harmful to minors. But the board disagreed that the material, in the material that was challenged was harmful. Good for them. So good for Louisiana. St. Tammany. I know. An 18-year-old black trans man <laughs> shot to death last week outside a Maryland bar. <clears throat> Tashisha Shiha Woodland was shot multiple times in a parking lot of uh, the Big Dogs in Paradise Bar located in Mechanicsville, Maryland. 
Police do not believe her gender identity played a role in this murder. They said her shooting was an isolated incident. Hmm. So oh, we'll see about yeah. that, huh? Sounds suspicious to me. I know. North Dakota Governor Doug Bergen, Burgum, Republican, vetoed a bill that would have uh, forbidden school districts from adopting any transgender inclusive policies without first notifying parents. The bill would have outed trans students and parents if the students wanted to be addressed correctly and the state's Republican-led legislature may not have enough votes to override his veto. <coughs> The answer is they didn't. They didn't. Good. Right. All right. So All right. That's good to know. Keys up to the minute. Yeah. Ugh. Kentucky, Kentucky Republican-led legislature has overridden Democratic Governor Andy Beshear's no. veto of a sweeping anti-transgender mm -hmm. bill in omnibus legislation covering the raft, the raft of anti-trans restrictions and bans was expanded and passed by Kentucky lawmakers. So that was that one. After career spanning six decades, Darcel the 15th, the world's oldest working drag queen, has died at 92. And she was still working. And here's a picture. <coughs> the longtime drag addict was performing in her native Portland until just days before her death from unknown causes at this time. So there's the picture. And a federal judge in Texas ruled that at least 12 books removed from public libraries by Liamo County officials, many because of their LGB and racial content, must be placed back into shelves within 24 hours, according to an order filed Thursday. Seven residents sued county officials in April, claiming their First and Fourteenth Amendment rights were violated when books deemed inappropriate by some people in the community and Republican lawmakers were removed from public libraries. Our access was restricted. The lawsuit filed in the U.S. District Court from the Western District of Texas in San Antonio claimed county officials remove books from the shelves of the three-branch public library system because they disagree with the ideas that are in them and terminated access of thousands of digital books because they could not ban two specific titles. Books ordered to return to the shelves include Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. They called themselves the KKK. The Birth of an American Terrorist Group by Susan Campbell, Barton Luddy, and Being Jazz, My Life as a Transgender Teen by Jazz Jennings. And so for my last story before we move on to Anne, is country music superstar Reba McIntyre says she tries to stay out of politics, but she can't help being disappointed in the anti Drag bill recently signed into law by Tennessee Governor Bill Lee. The Los Angeles Times asked McIntyre what she thought of the drag law, which defines male and female impersonators as adult cabaret performers and bans adult oriented performances that are harmful to minors. As the legislation, legislation's text states, drag performances are banned from public property and venues accessible to minors. I wish they would spend as much time, she said, and energy and money on feeding the homeless children and other people in our culture. Um, and uh, she said of the state legislator. So good for you. And, and also, take away the drag queen and she just lost her fashion tips. Right. <laughs> yeah. There we are. <laughs> All right, Ann, what do you have? I exotic have... places we can go to. Well, first we're gonna go to the world because I have world news involving track bans of transgender athletes. Um, this tightens the rule for Castor Semenya, <clears throat> who is pictured before you now. Uh, track and field banned transgender athletes from international competition Thursday while adopting new regulations that could keep Castor Semenya and other athletes with differences in sex development from competing. 
a pair of decisions expected to stoke outrage, um, according to in a pair of decisions, the uh, World Athletics Council adopted the same rules as swimming did last year to bar athletes who have transitioned from male to female and who have gone through male puberty. No such athletes currently compete at the highest levels of track. Uh, another set of updates for athletes with differences <coughs> in sex development could impact up to 13 high-level runners, uh, WA President Sebastian Coe said. They include Semenya, a two-time Olympic champion at 800 meters who has been barred from that event since 2019. Hmm. Semenya and others have been able to compete without restrictions in events outside the range of 400 meters through one mile, but now still have to undergo hormone-suppressing treatment for six months before competing to be eligible. Coe conceded that there are no easy answers to this topic, which has turned into social societal lightning involving advocates concerned with keeping a level playing field in women's sports and others who don't want to discriminate against transgender and DSD athletes. Uh, ath athletes with sex development dif differences, such as Semenya and Olympic 200-meter silver medalist Christine Mboma of Namibia, are not transgender. So the two issues share similarities when it comes to sports. Such athletes were legal, legal, legally identified as female at birth, but have a medical condition that leads to some traits, including high levels of testosterone, that World Athletics argues gives them <clears throat> the same kind of unfair advantage as transgender athletes. Semenya has been running in longer events. She finished 13th in her qualifying heat at 5,000 meters at World Championships last year. In a recent interview, she said she was aiming to run in the Olympics at a longer distance. <clears throat> now, in order to compete at next year's Olympics, she would have to undergo hormone-suppressing treatment for six months, something she has said she will never do again, having undergone the treatment a decade ago under previous rules. Another athlete, Olympic 800-meter silver medalist Francine Nyon Saba of Burundi, also said she would not undergo treatment. While Semenya struggled at longer distances, Nyon, Nyon Saba had relative success winning Diamond League titles at 3,000 and 5,000 meters and running in the 5,000 uh, running, running in the 5,000 at the Tokyo Olympics. Under the new regulations, athletes in the previously unrestricted events uh, would have to suppress testosterone levels below a certain level per liter of blood for six months. Ultimately, they would have to stay below those levels for two years. So this is terrible legislation that's, you know, is par for the course these days in athletics. And I have another story about that later. But now let's turn to really bad kind of miserable news that I'm just going to give it to you straight and at length. Uganda's parliament uh, has, passes an ex has passed an extremely anti-LGBTQ bill. Yesterday, uh, Ugandan lawmakers approved new legislation that entrenches the criminalization of same-sex conduct. It also creates new offenses <coughs> that were will curtail any activism on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues and eradicate LGBT people from any form of social... Thank you, American Christians, huh? Well, yeah, and that's another story I didn't discuss at length, but U.S. evangelicals have been over there promoting this legislation for a long time. Uh, the anti... The 2023 anti-homosexuality bill confirms an already existing punishment of life imprisonment for same-sex conduct, <coughs> while also increasing to 10 years the prison sentence for an attempted same-sex conduct. But one of the most egregious provisions, the bill calls it aggravated homosexuality, calls for the death penalty in certain circumstances, including for serial offenders 
or for anyone having same-sex relations with a person with a disability, oh. thereby automatically denying persons with disabilities the capacity to, to consent to sex. Oh. The bill also outlaws the promotion of homosexuality, effectively instituting a system of complete censorship of LGBT issues. Anyone advocating for the rights of LGBT people or providing financial support for organizations that do so could face up to 20 years imprisonment. LGBTQ rights can also be deemed unable to legally operate. Um, in addition, anyone who advertises, publishes, prints, broadcasts, distributes material, including digitally, is regarded as promoting or encouraging homosexuality and would face criminal sanction. The bill also criminalizes any person who fails to report someone they suspect of participating in the same sex. How did they get acts. such a foothold in the country? Well, it's been going on for a while. Remember, they had the Kill the Gays bill. Right, was... right. But I mean, they seem to have gotten a really, a really big foothold. And wasn't there a demonstration against them? In South Africa? Well, that's what you told me. And yeah. I was going to report on that last time, next time because it's okay. such late breaking news. But there's been an inter. I mean, it's really important that South Africa take a stand against this bill. But that's outside of Uganda. Yeah. yeah. The question exactly. is how did it get such a foothold in Uganda? And it's because the Christians have been, you know, the, the evangelical movement was giving them there. support when nobody else was. So uh -huh. they were already. Are they a Protestant before. country? I wonder. You got it. Anyway, yeah. I don't know. I'll have to research that. And speaking of questions that I failed to answer, last time I, which is, you know, I responded halfway to Linda's question, but when we were talking about Namibia next time, both of you said, if the Supreme Court has ruled against those uh, fathers, right. what recourse do they have? And I looked it up and couldn't find anything. So my only belated response is that they're going to have to probably um, find other ways to appeal it hmm. also to the Supreme Court. And my you know, pie in the sky hope is that if they keep appealing, the Supreme Court will get sick of their appeal, as has happened in, in well, but anyway, it doesn't look great in Namibia. But um, so the bill also criminalizes any person who fails to report someone they suspect of participating in same-sex acts to the police, which I just mentioned, calling for a fine or imprisonment for six months. Effectively, supportive family members or friends of LGBTQ people could not be imprisoned, could be imprisoned if they failed to report their loved ones to authorities. If anyone conducts same, a same-sex marriage ceremony, they could be imprisoned up to 10 years. A provision in the bill also outlaws providing accommodation that facilitates the offense of homosexuality. So if anyone were to rent a room to a gay couple, they could go to jail for 10 years. Mm. Uh, Museveni, the president, has 30 days to assent or reject the anti-homosexuality bill. If the law comes into force, it will violate the rights to freedom of expression and association, liberty, privacy, equality, freedom from discrimination, <coughs> and human and degrading treatment, and a fair hearing, all guaranteed under Ugandan and international law for all Ugandans. Now, a little background. More than 30 African countries, including Uganda, already banned same-sex relations. The new law appears to be the first outlaw merely identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Supporters of the law says it's intended to support a broader array of LGBTQ activities, which they say threaten traditional values in the conservative and religious East African nation. Now, I have a picture before you of a profile in Courage, Frank Mugisha, who is a prominent Ugandan LGBTQ activist. Of course, he has denounced the legislation. This law is very extreme and draconian. It criminalizes being an LGBTQ person, but also they're trying to erase <coughs> the entire existence of any LGBTQ Ugandan. I hope he doesn't still live there. 
Uh, he, sure, he he's does. there. Ugh. And a prominent activist was murdered not that a few years ago. Museveni has not commented on the urgent, on the current proposal, but has long opposed LGBTQ rights and signed an anti-LGBTQ law in 13 that Western countries condemned before a domestic court struck it down on procedural grounds. That was the Kill the Gays bill. In recent weeks, Ugandan authorities have cracked down on LGBTQ people after religious leaders and politicians alleged students were being recruited into homosexuality in schools. This oh, month, authorities arrested a secondary school teacher in the East District of Jinja over accusations of grooming of the grooming of young girls into unnatural sex I think practices. we should start a, a movement to like pay for um, our um, evangelicals to go live over there. She was subsequently charged with growth, gross indecency and is in prison awaiting trial. The police said on Monday they had arrested six people accused of running a network that was actively involved in the grooming of young boys into acts of sodomy. Oh, we're going to have to move on in. You're going to have to get to the rest of your stories after. Okay, can I just have a related story? Uh, Kamala Harris, as we know, mm -hmm. went and visited Ghana recently. Yeah. And um, there's hope that she has softened the country's stance because Ghana has an anti-LGBTQ bill that's just just as bad as this. Uh, so maybe Harris was able to make inroads into that. I hedge. certainly hope so. All right. So on our Becca watch, <laughs> this from our U.S. Representative Becca Ballant. Republicans have just introduced and passed a bill in the U.S. House to defund public schools that allow trans children to participate in sports or that allow books on LGBTQ history okay. in their classrooms. This bill is a part of a growing movement to push transgender Americans out of public life to label LGBTQ adults as groomers and to isolate LGBTQ youth from any sense of belonging in our schools or communities. This month, I traveled around Vermont to speak with folks about the urgent issues people are facing, housing, child care, and protecting social safety nets like Social Security and Medicare. I also spoke directly with high school students about their need for additional support in schools for things like mental health. Not one person, not one in all my travels around the state advocated for less funding for schools or for punishing and ostracizing trans children. Increased visibility for LGBTQ Americans over the past several decades has allowed for greater progress. But today, it is now being weaponized by partisan extremists across the country to target the most vulnerable in our communities, LGBTQ youth. And following up on that, Becca and State Treasurer Michael Pichak mm -hmm. were at the Transgender Day of Visibility, which was also the outright leadership summit on the State House lawn, we were where all they, there. well, I was going to say, which we all attended, to which the youth handed them their priorities for solidarity, saying these are the things we need. There were 268 youth wow. in attendance. 28 of them spoke. And there were times when the youth speaking became overwhelmed and just stopped, to which the people around them just yelled, we love you. And the youth was able to continue. This was <clears throat> one of the comments that were made by one of our youth. We need the state to act in our defense and say queer people are safe here by passing laws that protect us. We deserve to live and work and play like kids. <coughs> We're still kids. <laughs> it and was so encouraging to see them marching and they were coming and they and just coming kept and coming, coming, and coming and chanting. Well, I mean, it was really... Uh, one of the things that, just sort of from the geek perspective, 
they had to move the leadership summit from the state house to the pavilion auditorium because they had too many people. They exceeded the limit on what any of the rooms in the state house could contain. So, thank you. Yes. But related to that, the House has given, has passed H483. Now, this is the bill that we've been talking about for a while, and it would strengthen anti discrimination measures, place a moratorium on new independent school approvals, and make it impossible or nearly impossible for independent schools to reject publicly tuitioned students. And this is the part that gives clarity to it. Under this proposed legislation, independent schools, private schools, would need to affirm that they would comply with state anti-discrimination rules and would be subject to more <laughs> oversight from public school yes. officials. All right. So they've put some strong language. It's now in the Senate. It's already in Senate Judiciary, and I'm waiting to see when it's going to be picked up. And I'm going to close really quickly because I want I want time to share the yes. poem for our trivia question. But this is for for Anne. H. Wait. No, that's the wrong bill. The. <laughs> House has passed H230, Mechanism to Reduce Suicide. This bill includes in it a safe storage requirement if there are vulnerable adults or ch underage children in the household. And there is a 72-hour waiting period on the purchase of a handgun. Yes. And... <coughs> Anybody who is selling handguns, like the shop in Waterbury, has to post this sign. And it specifies how large the sign needs to be. Warning, access to a firearm in the home significantly increases the risk of suicide, death during domestic violence disputes, and the unintentional death of children, household members, and others. If you or a loved one is experiencing distress or depression, call the 988 Suicide and Crisis Hotline or text VT to 741-741. They have to display it. Nice. They cannot remove it. Good. And, they, and it isn't just this little <laughs> sign that... You would miss coming in the door. Well, no, yeah. and the legislation says how large the lettering needs to be. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to move to you. OK. Well, we don't have good news around the country like this, but. Then maybe we should go right to the poem. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, that's some good news. According to a Texas federal judge, ensuring against HIV transmission violates the religious freedom of companies that object to LGBTQ plus people. So insurance companies cannot be forced to cover the medicines. As a result of his ruling, a whole host of preventive services required to be covered <coughs> by insurance providers under the F Affordable Care Act are in doubt. So that would be like PrEP or anything like that. OK. Yeah. Um, speaker. Nancy, uh, well, Speaker Emerita, Emer, Emerita, Nancy Pelosi took the stage at the Human Rights Campaign Dinner in Los Angeles. The esteemed Congresswoman to advocate, oh, take pride in what you have, she said. Look at what has been done by showing our pride. Pat yourself on the back. Let's be hopeful for the sex, for the success we've had and the love we have shown each other. And that's what we have to do for the trans community now, especially the children. There's very hateful things that the other side is cooking up. So beware, Pelosi says. Texas Republicans have proposed a bill to make recognizing LGBTQ pride illegal in schools. That's nice. 
A Wisconsin elementary school administration told a first grade teacher that her class could not sing a song by Dolly Parton and My Miley Cyrus that so so celebrates acceptance because it might be controversial. The song's title, Rainbow Land, seems to be the source of the problem. Oh. A Hayer elementary teacher in, is it Waukesha? Yeah. yeah. Suggested the song, Rainbow Land, for the upcoming concert. So the music teacher asked the school's principal whether it was appropriate. Concerned enough to inquire further, the principal checked with the school district about the tune's appropriateness. However, the district central office deemed the song too controversial after reviewing it under its district school board policy 2240. This policy, policy addresses controversial topics in the classroom. This is a Sesame Street song. Oh, God. Oh, my God. And just quickly before I move on to Anne, because we want to make sure we have enough, uh, and I'll finish these next time. Uh, Three-time Formula One champion Nelson Piquet, or Picot, was ordered to pay a fine of nearly $1 million in moral damages for racist and homophobic comments aimed at Mercedes driver Lewis Hamilton. A court ruling published um, on Friday said the substitute judge of the 20th Civic Court of Brasilia sentenced sentence Formula One driver Nelson Picot to pay five million in compensation for collective moral damages. So, is that you know. a Brazil story? Well, not really, because I think the Lewis Hamilton is from the United States. Oh, uh, but homegrown. Yeah. All righty, Annie. I have so much. Material. You have about. Mm, nine minutes, so let's go. <laughs> well, I don't have bad news entirely. I didn't mean to overwhelm our viewers with Uganda because other things are happening around the world that aren't so bad, including uh, constitutional court legalizing same-sex marriage in Bolivia. And now you, uh, uh, before you is a picture of David Arukipa and Guido Montano. Uh, they filed a lawsuit in 2018, five years later. Same-sex marriage, they, they won the suit and same-sex marriage is legal in Bolivia. Okay. Um, going, that was the South American news, now in Asia. Uh, following the sort of anti-transgender theme that seems to be going around, uh, conservatives in the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan issue they have an issue with the gender identity clause in an LGBTQ bill. Um, they're conservative lawmakers and they're called the Liberal Democratic Party. They have yet to begin internal discussions because they don't want to even cover, even touch this uh, <laughs> LGBTQ rights bill until April after their elections. But at a Thursday uh, Parliament Committee meeting, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, who is also the LDB president, only said that the party is preparing to submit the bill. So they're okay, apparently, with LGB rights, but not, they don't want to include gender identity. Good news from Nepal. The Supreme Court has made a historic decision recognizing same-sex marriage. And I have <laughs> another picture before you of Adhip Kokaro who is Nepali, and German citizen Taoist Holtz. And so uh, they- They get married. I know it. They, well, they applied uh, for a tourist visa that was denied. And so finally, uh, it has been accepted. And the Supreme Court has issued an order of the name of the government to recognize same-sex marriage. So if they can have a tourist visa, why can't they get married? It's the essence of the message yeah. from the Supreme Court. Now let's turn to a clip from a Pakistan film called Joyland. Uh, in inner city Lahore, a severe patriarch is the head of the middle class Rana family, which includes his two sons, daughters-in-law, and four granddaughters. He wants his children to give him a grandson and forces his daughter-in-law, Mumtaz, to quit her job after Haydar 
his younger son and her husband find work wait a minute and her husband <laughs> finds work at an erotic dance theater but all changes when Hadar falls in love with Biba a transgender dancer oh. so let's look at a oh. clip of Joyland Jokes not quick एक मच्छर ने मुर्गी नाल प्यार हो गया मच्छर तो मुर्गी ने पप्पी की थी तो मच्छर बर्ड फ्लू तो मार गया तो मुर्गी डंगी तो पूछ क्यों क्यों क्योंकि मोहब्बत का अंजाम मौत है <coughs> अच्छा नहीं लगा बिल्कुल नहीं पहले नच्चा किसी थिएटर चेक नहीं कम की थिएटर मैनेजर किधरे और जाके रोला पाला बी बारी मैडम कहना है मैंने ए बुद्धि है तो बाहर नहीं होती जा रही उन्हें दी भी बुद्धि लगेगी पोस्टर दे में तेरी मोटी बुद्धि तो पास की जगह बच्चे की तुम अपनी बुद्धि लावा चल लाइक कर दे तू नहीं नहीं लाइक नहीं लाइक कर दे लाइक कर दे Kind of looks okay, intense. Okay, now the usual question, and I could see this how or where. <laughs> Prime Video, Disney Plus, <laughs> HBO Max, Apple TV Plus, Paramount, and all streaming services. You anticipated our. I question. did. I'm getting ready for your questions. Now let's go to um, Europe. A Ukraine soldier calls for marriage equality as the war with Russia wages. We could die tomorrow, 30-year-old Anna Zavatikova lamented, and apparently marriage, heterosexual marriages have skyrocketed since the war began because of the sense of urgency. Uh, and she says she serves in the 47th Brigade of Ukraine's Armed Forces, says that um, I feel like something is taken from me every time I see one of our soldiers is getting married, as I think of the fact that I can't do it if I wanted to with a woman. Um, a marriage proposal was presented to Zelensky, a same-sex marriage proposal, and he said, yes, yes, of course, but we can't do it till after the war. So um, she's urging more urgency, and someone has proposed uh, more urgent bill for same-sex marriage. We must do it immediately. LGBTQ Ukrainians deserve to have a family. Every day can be their last, just like for any other Ukrainian. Um, so let me, I may have to go through quickly the rest of my European news, but I do have pictures. The first same-sex couple to marry in Northern Ireland are humbled and grateful to be making history. And here they are, Robin Peoples on the left and Shani Edwards. Waitress Shani Edwards and senior care assistant Robin Peoples, 26, got married on Tuesday, February 11th, which is their sixth anniversary. So um, they had a little bit of a long distance relationship. Um, one is from Brighton, um, Sharni is originally from Brighton. They moved there, but she uh, she was there, and then they, she visited her cousin in Belfast and met Robin. Then they both moved to um, Brighton, but then got homesick and went back to Belfast. They became engaged in 2015 on a trip to Paris to see Ariana Grande in concert. Robin had a lock engraved with their names on it. When they went to the uh, place where the 
to add the love lock in Paris, um, that's Robin been, got... That's been dismantled, hasn't it? Well, I don't know, but it, when it occurred, okay. um, Robin got down on one knee to propose. So um, the following year, Sharni proposed back in their house on Robin's birthday. I laid out loads of rose petals that spelled out, will you marry me? How so romantic. That's, that's very romantic. Um, I have a few more stories. I'll just do the headlines. A lesbian couple from Ukraine opened up about how they fled the war and got married in Ireland. Uh -huh. So they were very, they've been involved for 11 years before they got married. They were very closeted in Ukraine, moved to Ireland, and got married. So, um, bad news from England. We have to, I'm afraid. So where? England. Okay. London, and you know, I defer to Keith in not reporting the creepy, creepy details of this story, and I figured I wouldn't have time anyway. <laughs> the Metropolitan Police in report that the London police um, are full of homophobic officers obsessed oh, yeah, with that. gay yeah. sex, yeah. and they grill lesbian officers, and this report was finally issued and read, and it details chapter and verse of all the creepy things that happened in the London Police Department. So they're taking action. And finally- and taking action? The government? Yeah. Okay. Or yes. the or police officials? Both. Okay. Both. Because now the report has been made public and everybody- oh. yeah. they, they can't get the officers out of the public bathrooms? Right. Well, um, mm -hmm. let's end on a transphobic note. Swim England bans <laughs> trans women from female competitions going along with the world track and field. And, um, so. Real quickly, we're following up with the British police officers, the two officers in Vermont that were being investigated for engaging in racist and homophobic comments, online game, online games. They were from Southern Vermont, Vermont mm -hmm. State Police. They weren't able to validate all but enough of the allegations that the commissioner said disciplinary action up to and including termination was warranted. They both have resigned and they have issued a formal apology saying our actions are inexcusable. We let down our fellow officers and we let down Vermont. Good. So, but I hope they don't get a job somewhere else. Well, in the police. well, I I anticipated that comment. Vermont still doesn't have the, the listing of these are the discredited officers, which is is something that people are really pushing for them and looking at police reform. And where a piece they go to from do. here? But they were four so, of those. There were like five of them, weren't they? they all no, they, they, they were. Or something? They were a number of them engaging in the game, but there were only two that engaged in the racist and homophobic comments. And the the actual report lists some of the things that the two officers said. And but I mean. They, they also went back and looked at did all you of their... the apology? I did. It, it, but they went back and looked at all of their reporting and there was nothing that indicated a bias in their actual policing. Well, what was but, very disturbing besides the actions, especially against lesbian police officers, is that they remain, they remain silent. They yeah. just took it. Yeah. Well, with this, it was other officers in Vermont that reported them. Yeah, so this was an outside study. Right. So since you're, since you're up and going, the answer to the trivia question, <laughs> although an obscure poet during their lifetime, widely considered the most distinguished Greek poet? Kafavi. And this is what W.H. Auden said in a preface to a collection of poetry. Kafavi was a homosexual, and his erotic poems made no attempt to conceal it. As a witness, Kafavi is exceptionally honest. He neither boulderizes nor glamorizes nor giggles. He refuses to pretend that his memories of moments of sensual pleasure are unhappy or spoiled by feelings of guilt. And this is one of his poems, The Afternoon Sun. This room, how well I know it. Now they're renting it, and the one next to it is offices. The whole house has become an office building for agents, businessmen, companies. 
this room, how familiar it is. The couch was here near the door, a Turkish carpet in front of it, close by the shelf with two yellow vases. On the right, no opposite, a wardrobe with a mirror. In the middle, the table where he wrote and the three big wicker chairs. Beside the window, the bed where we made love so many times. There must still be around somewhere, those old things. Beside the window, the bed, the afternoon sun used to touch half of it. One afternoon at four o'clock, we separated for a week only. And then that week became forever. Oh, so. beautiful. <sighs> so with that. With that lovely romantic. Do you have anything else to say? Oh, Anne? I have plenty else to say. <laughs> I mean, we have a few more minutes. Well, I could see. So, All you right. Know. You thought the poem was larger. You thought the poem was one of yours. I love it that. It had more verses. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a poem on every show. Ooh. Um, all right, let's go back to these Ukrainian, this Ukrainian couple. They moved to Ireland last St. Patrick's Day. Uh, their names are Uliana and Alina. Uh, they've been a couple for over a decade, as I said. See, this goes with the poem, how romantic. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a <laughs> little more positive, maybe. Um, St. Patrick's Day marks one year since they landed safely on the Emerald Isle. They met online through a dating website called Mamba, where they were living when they were living in their home nation. They exchanged messages and went out for tea chatting effortlessly for hours. After that initial meeting, they continued to meet again and again, dating privately and pretending to be friends. They were able to live together in Kiev, uh, but they couldn't tell anyone they were a couple. They said to everyone else, we were sisters, we were friends for 10 years. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February last year, they decided to move away. It was very difficult to leave their families behind as they decided to remain in Ukraine. But living in Ireland allowed them to get married in November 2022, something they had previously only dreamed of. This war has brought a lot of grief to the Ukrainian people, and we couldn't believe that such horror could happen in the modern world. But the strong spirit of Ukrainian people and their desire to fight for their independence and development, as well as the support of other nations, gives us faith that justice will triumph and the terrorist state of the Russian Federation will be punished for every crime against humanity. Coming back to a Vermont story real quickly, sure. and, I, and I was going to talk with you both at dinner if you had heard about this. JAG Productions and oh, White absolutely. River Junction. Yes. Absolutely. They, well, another theater company is coming in and being the company in residence within the opera house. So they're taking up most of the time. So now JAG has no performance space. Oh, no. Although right now Jarvis Green is doing a one-man show Where? there. There. There at the Briggs Opera House. Right. So what are they going to do? He, well, that's what the whole story was about is he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's looking for alternative space. There is some performance space. Uh, the theater on the hill at King Arthur Baking Company. We've been there, yeah. But, yeah, but it's yeah, but limited space. Well, and it was outside because of COVID. Right. But what he's saying is there isn't other performance space in the area. What about his? The, um, Lost Nation. Well, we went well to they, have, they have City Center, so they're the company in residence, and they take up most yeah. of the time that that space is available. Yeah. Well, there's Northern Stage, which is right down the block, and I have to say, Lynn and I were just at a play there last weekend. We saw Sweat by Lynn It was Nodders. really good. And that's a nice venue, but... What Jarvis is saying is, I may have to leave Vermont. Oh, that would be awful. But... Well, and, but in the meantime, go and see his one-man show. Um, okay. All righty. Well. On that note. Definitely. Go to the theater. Go to the movies. Listen to poetry. Listen to poetry and resist. Resist. <laughs>